wait until your father gets home. It's the threat my mom would issue whenever I refused to respect her authority when I was a kid. And I have to admit that it was a threat that never failed to work. Now, it'll help you to know that my mom, she was such a sweet lady that she really found it difficult to discipline me and my brother when we were misbehaving. And when we were really young, I mean, I was kind of a mama's boy, and just a stern look from her would send me crying. But then, you know, I got to age five and six and seven, got a little bit more rebellious, and next thing you knew, I, I didn't care anymore. And, and, and I was willing to disobey her, and, and so she found it difficult to, to discipline. And I remember the day when she finally decided that it was time that she gave me a spanking. And I have to admit that the spanking was so weak that I actually laughed at her. That's right. I laughed at my mom who was trying to discipline me. And that was the first time I ever heard those words. Just wait until your father gets home. Now my dad, he could give a spanking. And I knew a whole lot about that. And I just remember for the rest of that day, after having laughed at my mom, I sat there after hearing those words. And my heart was filled with fear as I sat there and waited to receive the righteous wrath of my father. Now, in light of this story, I realize that there's a spiritual truth that many people are, are experiencing here in the world today. You see, there are many unbelievers here on planet Earth who are kind of sitting on the bed waiting for the heavenly father to get home, so to speak. They know that it's only a matter of time before they stand before a holy God and he issues his holy decree of righteous wrath. And while there are many unbelievers who insist that they've done nothing deserving of eternal punishment, the fact is this, we're all sinners. We're all sinners who deserve the righteous wrath of God. And with that being the case, there should be no debate that God the Father will be right and he will be righteous when he pours out his wrath upon the unbeliever who refuses to repent of their sins. Here in our study this morning, we're going to consider three of those reasons for why God the Father will be right to pour out his righteous wrath upon the unrepentant. And as we make our way through our text today, we'll soon see, first of all, that God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of idolatry. Secondly, this morning, we'll see that God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of tyranny. Thirdly, and finally, this morning, we'll see that God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of blasphemy. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 16, because here we find the Apostle John. He's describing the day when the seven angels will begin to pour out their seven bowls of wrath. And as you're making your way to Revelation 16, well, I want to continue setting the stage for our study today by taking a moment to remind you that this time of tribulation will begin with the opening of a scroll, which has been secured with seven seals. Then once the seventh seal is opened, the opening of that scroll will release seven angels who will be given seven trumpets, which will be used to alert the world to the corresponding seven judgments, and the seventh of which will then initiate the seven bowls of judgments, which John describes here in Revelation chapter 16. And so with all this background in mind, if you would look with me here at Revelation 16, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here John declares... Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. 
Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Here in our text today, we find an unidentified voice. He's directing the seven angels who came out of the temple. We saw that in our text last week. And as they come out of the temple, this unidentified voice declares go, and he sends them to go and pour out the plagues of God's wrath upon the unrepentant people who will be here on the planet during the time of the great tribulation. And as we examine the way in which the first five bowls of wrath will impact those unrepentant people it would be easy for us to begin to question the goodness of God. As we consider the pain and the the sores which will come upon people, as we consider the way that this wrath will impact this planet, we can begin to think that God isn't as good as we once thought. We can begin to think that God is, is just a big old meanie up in heaven, waiting to squash us like a bug. And yet we must understand, before we allow our minds to go there, We have to see that these plagues of his wrath are going to be poured out upon those who refuse to repent of their sins. Ultimately, they are going to refuse to receive the love of the truth. God will be extending to them the love of his truth, but they will reject it. This was precisely the point that Paul was making in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he describes these same people as those who will perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Not only that, but he's also telling us there in 2 Thessalonians 2 that they're going to be condemned, not because God just wants to condemn them, but rather because they will not believe the truth, but instead they take pleasure in their own unrighteousness. And so we see then that the unbelievers who are here during the great tribulation, uh, they're going to receive the seven plagues of God's wrath because of their unrepentance, because they refuse to repent. And first of all, we see that they refuse to repent of their idolatry. In order to prove my point, if you would look with me again there at verse two, here in Revelation 16, verse 2, we learn that the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, here in this verse, we find John, he's helping his audience to understand that the first plague is going to affect those who worship the image of the beast. This reminds me of something that we learned back in Revelation chapter 13 where John described that day when the false prophet will place an image of the Antichrist within the Holy of Holies of the Tribulation Age temple. And it's at that point in time when the false prophet places that image of the Antichrist within the Holy of Holies, that's when he's going to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Or in other words, those who will not bow down and those who will not worship this this icon, this idol of the Antichrist, those people will be martyred. Now, just to be clear, the word image, which is found there in verse 2 and found back in Revelation 13, that that word is, it, it comes from the Greek word icon. And the word icon, it simply speaks of an image which represents something else of greater significance or greater meaning. I should also point out that icons, they're they're found in many different forms. For example, you can find icons in the forms of signs and logos, pictures, paintings, and statues. And so an icon isn't just relegated to one specific style of art. While it's true that an icon, it's not automatically an idol, it's also true that the icon becomes an idol the very second it becomes the focus of our worship. In order to further explain what I'm talking about, that many of us have icons in our house of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you have a a painting of, of an artist's depiction of the Lord Jesus hanging on the wall, or maybe you have a statue of the Lord Jesus sitting on a shelf. These are icons, and they're nothing more than decorations. Uh, and, and if you have these sorts of decorations in your home, then I would just remind you that these are nothing more than an artist's idea of what our Savior possibly looked like. Therefore, the Christian who begins to worship these icons... Uh, they're actually crossing a line and engaging in idolatry. For example, if you have a painting of the Lord Jesus or you have a a picture of the statue, and that's what comes to mind when you pray or that's what comes to mind when you worship, the icon is now becoming an idol. That's when we start engaging in idolatry when we imagine these things as 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And in light of this example of this crossing of the line between the icon and the idol, I want to consider how those who receive the mark of the beast are going to be guilty of worshiping the icon of the Antichrist. And at that moment, the icon becomes an idol. Now, it's important to understand that the word worship, which is seen there at the end of verse 2, it's translated from a Greek word which was used to describe those who would fall upon their knees before the king. And they would touch their ground, uh, they would touch the ground with their forehead as an expression of profound reverence. This is the sort of worship whereby somebody submits themselves to the authority of another. Not only that, but the Strong's Concordance also helps us to grasp the meaning of that word worship by presenting us with a very graphic illustration of a dog licking its master's hand. If you have a dog and that dog, you, you come home from work and that dog is just so excited, you know, to see you. I mean, some dogs uh, are so excited that they just run up and start licking you, right? And, and that's the kind of worship that we're supposed to have for the Lord. We're supposed to be so excited to be in his presence, so excited that, that we just want to kiss him. It's also interesting to note that this is the same word, worship, that the Lord Jesus used in Matthew chapter 4, where he declares, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. We're only supposed to worship the Lord. No icons, no idols. We're not supposed to worship anything other than the Lord. And we do this by serving him. Now, you might not know this, but Jesus was actually quoting the book of Deuteronomy. And with this as our focus, hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, because I want to consider the context of this quote. You see, it's in Deuteronomy 6 where we find Moses. He's explaining and even expanding upon the first two commandments of the Decalogue, which are centered around the fact that there's one and only one God, and it's sin to make an idol of any other false god. Now, in light of this context, if you would look with me here at Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want to focus your attention there on verse 13. Here Moses declares, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Now here in these verses, we find Moses helping the chosen people to understand that there's one and only one God. There aren't many gods. There's only one God. And according to Moses here, he is a God who is jealous with godly jealousy. Now, this has provided some level of confusion for many people because many of us have been taught to believe that all forms of jealousy are bad and wrong, and that's just not the case. Not all forms of jealousy are bad. And just to be clear, we're not talking about the jealousy that stems from envy. We're not talking about the jealousy that stems from human insecurity, these are the forms of jealousies that are selfish and wrong. But there is a godly or a holy jealousy which is found within the heart and mind of the Lord. And this godly jealousy is based on his passion for our protection. And he recognizes that if we go off and start worshiping idols, he's going to have to punish us because our heart is in the wrong place. Our love is being directed to something that is false or fictional. And so he has a godly jealousy for us. He doesn't want us to worship idols because he recognizes that those who will not repent of idolatry must be punished. And so he's jealous for us because he doesn't want to punish us. He wants to protect us from his righteous wrath, which will be poured out upon every unrepentant idolater. And with this in mind, I'd like you to make your way back to Revelation chapter 16. And I want to consider how the jealousy of God results in his righteous wrath. If you would look with me again there in verse 2, because here John declares, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, here in this verse, we find John, he's describing some sort of disease which will infect those who worship the icon of the Antichrist. And in order to grasp the nature of these sores, it'll help you to first know that the Greek word translated foul, it speaks of something that's harmful and destructive. 
And so these sores will be destructive to the body. And the Greek word translated loathsome there refers to a grievous disease which causes pain and peril. And so there's going to be a great deal of pain and a great deal of destruction which comes into the life of those who end up with this disease. Those who worship the icon of the Antichrist and those who receive his mark will be covered with these painful sores. And some have suggested that it's possibly an allergic reaction to the mark itself. Uh, maybe these people who receive the mark, uh, it, so, it sets off something in the body so that these sores start manifesting at some point in time. We, we can't be sure of that, but I think that's an interesting point. But regardless of how it happens, the Lord is going to send an angel to pour out this bowl, and as a result, people are going to be covered with these sores, and it's going to be painful. And yet, it's all because they were worshiping the icon of the Antichrist. This all reminds me of the sixth plague that the Lord poured out upon the Egyptians at the time when the Lord sent Moses to call for the release of the Hebrew slaves. It was at that point in time when the Egyptians found themselves covered with painful boils because they would not repent and respect the desires of the Lord. They wouldn't set the Hebrew slaves free. And so the Lord covered them with painful boils. Rather than repenting of their sins and rather than repenting of their slavery, they continued to harden their hearts against the Lord. And it's in similar fashion that the unbelievers who are here during the great tribulation, they're also going to find themselves covered with painful sores, much like those Egyptians. And just like the Egyptians, they too will continue to harden their hearts against the Lord. It's for this reason that the Lord will be right to pour out his wrath upon those unrepentant unbelievers. Now this brings us to our second point, because listen, God will not only be right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of their idolatry, but God will also be right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of their tyranny. And with this as our focus, let's continue to make our way through Revelation chapter 16, where we find the apostle John. He's describing the second and third plagues, which will eventually be poured out upon the planet. And if you would look with me there, beginning at verse 3, here we learn that the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now, here in these verses, we find the second and the third angels. They're pouring out their corresponding bowls. And it's at that point in time when the entire sea and all the streams of the earth will be turned into something that appears to be blood, as if it were flowing from the wounds of a dead man's body. Now, it's possible that this literally is human blood. And yet John seems to suggest here that this was merely a similitude. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at verse 3, because here again John tells us that it became blood as of a dead man. Or in other words, it became blood like a dead man. That word as of or like seems to suggest that it's a similitude, or it kind of appears to be blood, but it's not. You might remember it was back in chapter 8 where John described a day when the second angel who has the second trumpet will, will blow his trumpet. And at that point in time, something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea. And it's at that point in time when a third of the sea becomes like blood. There's some sort of corresponding effect to this great mountain falling into the sea and then the water turning into something that looks like blood. Not only that, but it's at that point in time when a third of the living creatures of the sea will die and a third of the ships will be destroyed. And then the third angel will sound the third trumpet and a great star, which is called Wormwood, will fall from heaven and land in the sea and it will poison a third of the waters, causing many men to die because the water is then poisoned. Based on this, we can see then that the second and third trumpet judgments are actually going to be a very small taste of the wrath that God will pour out upon the planet at the time of the second and third bowl judgments. We can kind of see how the trumpets are just kind of like a little precursor to what is about to happen. It also gives people a chance to recognize that things are not going well <laughs> and it might be time to repent and yet they won't repent. It's also interesting to note, though, that this is the same sort of plague that we find on a much smaller scale back in the book of Exodus at the time when God sent Moses to demand the release of the Hebrew slaves. If you would, hold your place here in the book of Revelation, and let's turn back to Exodus chapter 7. 
And as you turn to Exodus 7, I want to point out that this is where we find the Lord. He's sending Moses to stand before the Pharaoh of Egypt with a list of divine demands. And this is the point in time when when God said, okay, I've allowed you to enslave my people for a season, but the season is over. And it's time to release them. Unfortunately for the Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt, he was unwilling to obey the word of the Lord because he was a tyrant. Now, with all this background in mind, if you would look with me there at Exodus chapter 7, I want to draw your attention to verse 15 where Moses writes, Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's banks to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt." And here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's preparing to prove to the Pharaoh of Egypt that he wasn't really in charge, that he really wasn't the king of kings. And not only that, but he was about to prove to the Pharaoh that the Pharaoh and all the rest of the Egyptians were worshiping the wrong gods. He was trying to help the Pharaoh to understand that his tyrannical oppression of God's chosen people was at an end and his day was over. Now, this incredible miracle, it should have convinced the Pharaoh to set the Hebrew slaves free. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh refused to repent of his tyrannical rule over the chosen people of God. And as a result, he and the rest of Egypt received the wrath of God. And and, and he continued to harden his heart against the Lord. And the Lord continued to send plagues upon the land of Egypt. Pharaoh was a tyrant who was unwilling to bow a knee to the king of kings. And just to be clear, a tyrant is a leader who uses their power in a cruel and an unfair way. And without debate, Pharaoh was in fact a tyrannical ruler who had enslaved the people of God and therefore the Lord was righteous. He was right to pour out his wrath upon the people of Egypt. And in the same way, I would suggest that the Lord will also be right when he pours out his wrath upon those who will be serving the tyrannical ruler that we call the Antichrist. Every unrepentant unbeliever who is here during the great tribulation will be a servant of a tyrant. They will be servants of the Antichrist. And because they will not repent of serving this tyrant, the Lord is going to pour out his wrath upon them. And in order to prove my point, let's turn back to Revelation chapter 16, where we find an angel announcing the righteous judgment of the Lord. And if you would look with me, we'll focus there on verse 5. Here the apostle John declares, and I heard the angel of the waters saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Now here in these verses, we find John, he's describing this moment when he sees this angel who had some sort of authority over the waters, and he's proclaiming the praises of God. And while it's possible that this might be one of the two angels who poured out their bowls of wrath upon the waters of the earth, this angel of the waters, I believe he's probably a different angel. He seems to be more like the angel who we saw back in chapter 8 who was given power over fire. It's possible that God has called certain angels to certain responsibilities. And while one might be given power over fire of the earth, uh, this one seems to be uh, given power over the waters of the earth. This seems to be an angel who has been given the task of overseeing the waters of this world, which should not be confused with Water World, the movie, which is horrible. 
But back to the study, imagine for a moment how this angel who had power over the waters, imagine how he might feel as he watches two other angels show up on the scene and pour out these bowls with the plagues that ruin the waters that he's been overseeing for so many years. I mean, think about that for a moment. Here's this angel. He's been given a task to watch over the waters of the world. And then two other angels come along and say, oh yeah, we're going to ruin it today. We're basically going to destroy the ministry that you've had for years and years and years. How would you react? Well, let me ask you this. How do you react when the Lord shows up and shuts the door on a ministry opportunity that you've been involved with for several seasons? Maybe you've been serving the Lord in a certain ministry and all of a sudden someone else comes along and takes control of that ministry and it's just no longer the same and you're just kind of like, well, you know, what am I going to do now? How do you feel whenever the Lord sends a leader to redefine your ministry responsibilities Uh, or, or just shuts down a ministry altogether? What's your response? Do you blame the leader? and then allow a a root of bitterness to grow up until you decide to leave the church? Or or do you get mad at the Lord and just say, well, fine, I'm not going to serve you at all? Throughout my years, I've seen Christians giving both responses to changes that the Lord initiated. I've seen Christians who are stepped down from this position or the door closed on that position, all of a sudden it's just kind of like, well, I'm out of here. I've come across other Christians who haven't served the Lord for years and years because they got their toes stepped on at some point in time or, or they got their feelings hurt because the, the, the ministry came and was shut down or something. This sounds like something that you struggle with and I want you to focus on the reaction of this angel who had powers over the waters because he doesn't get mad at God. No, he begins to worship the Lord. Matter of fact, if you would look with me there at verse 3, because here we find the angel of the waters declaring, You are righteous, O Lord. Not how could you or why would you, but you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, or in other words, the infinite one. You are righteous, O Lord, the infinite one, because you have judged these things. This angel who was given charge over the waters rejoices in the righteous judgments of the Lord. And while it's true that the Lord's decision had a negative impact on his ministry, it's also true that he was simply quick to confess that the Lord is the infinite God whose decisions are always right. As a matter of fact, the Lord is the one, he is the standard by which we determine what is right and wrong. Apart from the Lord, we have no standard in and of ourselves. All we have is our own opinion without the Lord. And when my opinion and your opinion don't match up and you think something's right and I think something's wrong and, and we're at an impasse and a disagreement, who has the final say? You? Me? That doesn't make sense. The Lord is the one who is right. And he is righteous and all of his judgments are the right judgments. Therefore, we would do well to respond to every ministry change in the same exact way by quickly realizing that the Lord is the righteous ruler, which is to say that all of his judgments are right and what he decides is correct. And if we think it's wrong, then our perspective is the problem, not the Lord. In order to further grasp the proper perspective that this angel had, if you would look with me again there at verse 6, because here the angel declares, For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. In other words, this angel is saying, Hey, look, if you want to turn all the water into blood, that, the water that I've been guarding this whole time, if you want to turn it into blood and give these people blood to drink because they've been killing your prophets and saints, it's right. It's the right thing to do. As we examine this proclamation of praise, we can see that the Lord had, will, will have a righteous reason for pouring out these plagues on the day when he turns the water of this world into blood. In order to further prove my point, let's consider something that another angel says there in heaven. If you would look with me there at verse 7, because here John declares, I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Here in this verse, we find another angel, a second witness, if you will, standing at the altar there in heaven, confirming the fact that the judgments of God are not only true, meaning they correspond to reality, but they're also righteous, which is to say that they are always right. 
Whatever, God's de- whatever God decides, it's right. And it's true. And in this case, we can certainly agree that those who are submitting themselves to the tyranny of the Antichrist will deserve the wrath that they receive during the time of the Great Tribulation. And so consider the contrast here, because here you have an, an angel who was given authority over, over water, but he's not going to be a tyrannical ruler over the water by saying, no, God, you're wrong. Listen to, to, to what I say. And yet that's exactly what the Antichrist will be doing. He's going to be saying to God, no, you're wrong, God. And he's going to send people to kill the saints and the prophets during the time of the tribulation. Therefore, God will be right when he pours out his wrath upon this tyrant that we call the Antichrist and those who serve him. It's important for us to understand that God is eventually going to bring an end to the rule of every evil tyrant. And the reason why is due to the fact that there can only be one supreme leader. There can only be one king of kings. Oh, there can be a lot of kings, but there's only one king of kings. There can be a lot of little lords on the earth who have their own little areas of leadership, but there can only be one Lord of lords. And seeing how the Lord God of of the universe is the infinite one whose judgments are always true and always righteous, then doesn't it only stand to reason that every other leader here on earth should simply submit themselves to his almighty authority? And since that is the only thing that makes sense for us, then we must also agree that those who refuse to submit themselves to the king of kings, well, they're spiritually submitting themselves to the tyranny of the Antichrist. Now, I don't know if the Antichrist is on the planet today or not. Uh, My guess is that he is. But you have to understand that any ruler who will not submit to the king of kings is submitting themselves to the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is to to say, we don't need the real Jesus, I'm here as Jesus. We don't need the real king of kings, let me rule the world. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And it's nothing more than evil tyranny. And those who will not submit themselves to the king of kings are submitting themselves to the spirit of the Antichrist, which is nothing more than an evil tyranny. And it's for this reason that God is right to pour out his righteous wrath upon every person who attempts to live as a tyrant, regardless of their sphere of authority. So we see then that God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of their idolatry, and God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of tyranny. Finally, I want to consider how God is right to pour out his wrath upon those who refuse to repent of their blasphemy. And with this as our focus, let's continue to make our way through Revelation chapter 16, where we find the apostle John. He's now describing the fourth and the fifth plagues, which will eventually be poured out upon this planet. And if you would look with me again, we'll pick up our study at verse 8. Here we learn that the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, here in these verses, we find John describing this moment when the fourth angel will begin to turn up the heat on this planet, so to speak. He's going to pour out a plague on the sun, which is going to cause the the heat of the sun to increase. Maybe these are large solar flares, or or, or maybe it causes the, the sun to move a little closer to the earth. And I'm not really sure exactly how this plays out, but... What we do know is that uh, it's going to get hot. And in light of this plague, I should remind you of the way in which the sun was initially darkened at the time of the fourth trumpet judgment. It was back in Revelation chapter 8, verse 12, where we learned that the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that the third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So at that point in time, things are going to cool down a little bit with a third of the day Uh, being darkened. Not only that, but in Revelation 9, verses 1 and 2, we learn about the day when the fifth angel will sound his trumpet. And at that point in time, John says that a star will fall from heaven to the earth. And to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. And he opens the bottomless pit. and, And that's when smoke rises up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. 
And so here we find two different ways which the light of the sun will be darkened here on earth. The light of the sun will be drastically diminished from the time of the fourth trumpet judgment until the day when the fourth bowl is poured out upon the sun. And it's at that point in time when the heat of the sun will be turned up. It will be intensified so much that those who are here on the earth will be tormented and tortured by the heat of the sun. Now, I recognize that this is what we might call an inconvenient truth, but there should be no doubt that God is the one who will be causing the world to experience a whole new level of global warming. And I don't care how many Priuses we drive around today, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And God's going to be the one doing it. As hard as people are working today to stop global warming, God is going to turn up the heat. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at verse 9, because here we learn that the men who will be scorched with great heat will blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues. God is the one who has the power over these plagues. He's the one who turns up the heat. He's the one who will scorch the earth at that point in time. And it's for this reason that we learn at the end of verse 9 that they're going, to, they're going to continue to sin. They will not repent, nor will they give God glory. As the heat gets turned up and people are starting to burn up, they're not going to repent. They're not going to say, oh, God, forgive us. Uncle, you win. No. They will blaspheme his name. As a matter of fact, look with me there. At verse 10, where we find them continuing to blaspheme the name of God. Here John tells us that the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Now here we see the the scorching heat of the fourth plague giving way to a painful darkness which will come upon the earth, at the time of the fifth plague. And, and more specifically, this darkness will, will really affect the throne of the beast and his kingdom. So that might just be a description of the entire earth at that point in time, or it might just be a specific area, but there's going to be a darkness that comes upon the kingdom of the Antichrist. And it's possible that this darkness is going to be caused by uh, smoke from fires, which will start to break out from the scorching heat of the fourth plague. Uh, Imagine as the sun gets hotter and hotter, uh, you know, that things are just going to start catching on fire. So maybe uh, the the sun is once again darkened by smoke. At the same time, it's also possible that John was describing the darkness of blindness. One reason for believing this is based on the fact that the Greek word, which is translated darkness, well, it was oftentimes used metaphorically to describe blindness. You might not know this, but your eyes can actually get sunburnt, just like your skin. Your eyes can get sunburnt. As a matter of fact, the the front clear surface of the eye, which is called the cornea, it's composed of a tissue which is very similar to the skin, therefore can suffer, uh, uh, you know, sunburn. This condition is known as keratitis, and it results in blurry vision and even the inflammation of the cornea. I even uh, read one guy's testimony after having his eyes sunburnt while he was on vacation. And he talked about the way that he would wake up in the middle of the night and his eyeballs just felt like they were on fire. Imagine that, just sunburnt eyes. Now remember, the heat of the sun is going to be intensified at the time of the fourth plague. And men are going to be scorched with that heat. And you better believe that this is going to affect their eyes as well. So it's not hard to imagine that there's going to be many during that time who suffer from severe keratitis. And their eyes are going to feel like they're on fire. I believe that this is why John tells us that they're going to gnaw their tongues because of the pain. I'm sure we've all been in darkness before. Maybe you sleep with a nightlight still. But I'm sure most of us have been in the dark, and there's no pain uh, that comes from darkness unless you're walking through the house and step on one of your child's Legos. But darkness in general just doesn't produce pain. And so what kind of darkness comes along with pain so bad that you gnaw your tongue? And I'm guessing that it's going to be keratitis, that their eyeballs are going to be scorched by the sun. 
Not only that, but there in verse 11, John also describes the way in which they will blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Those unrepentant unbelievers who will be here during the great tribulation will refuse to repent of their evil deeds. Rather than repenting of their sins, they will continue to blaspheme the God of heaven. And for the sake of clarity, it'll help you to know that the Greek word translated blaspheme, it's used when referring to those who speak reproachfully of another or when someone defames the good name of another, that's blaspheming. Therefore, those who speak reproachfully of the Lord, they're gonna be blasphemers. You probably know what I'm talking about. Like if you've ever worked a construction job, then it's not uncommon to see people hitting their hand with a hammer and, and, and from that pain, just instant blasphemy. For years, I worked demolition. They would hook me up to a chain and then just swing me into the sides of walls and just, I was, I was the wrecking ball. But I constantly heard just the blasphemy of God as people would be injured on the job. Or maybe you just work, a, you know, a, an office job, but still something goes wrong. And, and the first words out of someone's mouth when they're disappointed is the name of Jesus. But being used like a curse word, they're not calling upon him and praying to him. No, they use the name of our Savior like a curse word. That's blasphemy. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. They're going to come to this place of extreme pain and torment. And rather than crying out in repentance, they're going to swear with blasphemy against the God of heaven. Now, in order to grasp the seriousness of this sin, we should take a moment to consider something that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 12. And so if you would, let's turn to Matthew 12, where we find the Lord Jesus. He's actually warning his audience about the sin, which is commonly referred to as the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And in order to understand the nature of this sin, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit is the third person of our triune God. Remember, our, our God, the, the one God of, of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, has revealed himself as being one God in three persons. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three co-equal and co-eternal. And so we have one God who is triune in nature, and the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. It's also important to understand that the Lord Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself and then turns around after his resurrection and sends the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the role of the Holy Spirit during the church ages is to, 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 to draw unbelievers to the grace of God by helping us to understand that we're guilty and we're in desperate need of a savior. And so this is the role of the Holy Spirit. And with all of this in mind, I want to consider something that Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 12. Let's focus there on verse 30. Here Jesus declares, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's warning his audience about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And in order to grasp the gravity of this Sin. It's important for us to realize that, again, the Holy Spirit is the one who has come to draw us to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes and testifies to our hearts that we are guilty of sin. He has come to convict the hearts of men so that we might recognize that we need a Savior because we're guilty before God. Sadly, the unrepentant unbeliever is the one who hardens their heart against that internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to every person and gives the, that same message that you're guilty before God and you need to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. But the unbeliever says, no, I'm not going to do that. 
And each time they harden their heart against the testimony of the Holy Spirit, they build a callus around their heart. They sear their heart as with a hot iron. And as they continue to to build a callus around their heart, all of a sudden they, they can no longer hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And at some point in time, they're so lost in their own unbelief that they might even speak blasphemous words against the Holy Spirit. And it's at that point in time when God lets them go to their own vile passions. This is precisely the point that Paul was making in Romans chapter 3 where he assured his audience that there is none who seek after God, no, not one. And it's important to understand that none of us will initiate the search for a savior. The unrepentant unbeliever will never initiate the search for God. And it's for this reason that the Lord sent the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts of sin and to draw us to our savior, Jesus. But there comes a point in time when a person has rejected the drawing of the Holy Spirit so much that they end up at the point of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us that he just turns us over to the bondage of our sinful nature. We can harden our hearts like Pharaoh did against the Lord so many times until the Lord finally is the one hardening our hearts. That's exactly what happened with Pharaoh. He hardened his heart against the Lord, and then another plague, and he hardened his heart against the Lord, and then another plague, and the Lord says, okay. I'm going to give you the right to continue hardening your heart against me until finally towards the end, God was the one hardening his heart. And listen, if the Holy Spirit stops drawing the unbeliever and the unbeliever will never search for God on his own, they're in the bondage of their sinful nature for the rest of eternity. And though they might one day stand before God, and as has been promised, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, they will then be sent into eternal punishment because they're still in their sins, having committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now it's possible that you're here this morning and and, and you're worried about this. Maybe you've read these verses before and you've learned about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and and since then you've been like, oh no, have I committed it? Am I guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And if you're here this morning and you're worried about it, then let me assure you, you haven't. Because the person who has committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit isn't worried about it. They don't care. Because they've hardened their hearts so much that they just love their sin. So if you're worried about it this morning, let me assure you that you're not guilty of it. If you're a born-again believer, then I, I can assure you this morning that you can't be guilty of it because the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is at the end of the road of the person's rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if you're a born-again believer, you've been born of the Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ, then you'll never commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you've received the testimony of the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. At the same time, though, it's possible you're here and you're not a Christian. And now that you've heard about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, maybe you're worried that you might commit this unforgivable sin. And if that's a concern of yours and you're an unbeliever, then I would encourage you, safeguard your life against this sin today by recognizing your need for the forgiveness of the Lord. And then by placing your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus who came and received our punishment when he died for our sins upon the cross. Repent and receive by faith the free gift of his grace. And in that way, you're saying yes to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. It's at that point in time when you're born of the Spirit and then sealed by the Spirit into the body of Christ. That's my encouragement to any unbeliever here this morning. Don't continue to harden your heart against the testimony of the Holy Spirit, but rather receive that testimony by receiving the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this way, you can avoid the wrath which will eventually come upon those who refuse to repent of their blasphemy.
Finally, I want to address the born-again believer who is resting this morning in the promise that there is now no condemnation for those who trust in Jesus Christ. And, and maybe that's where you're at right now. You're a believer and you're saying, I'm so thrilled to know that the Christian is no longer appointed to the wrath of God. I'm sure most Christians, if not all of us, realize that we've escaped the righteous wrath of God, which will eventually come upon those who refuse to repent of their idolatry or their tyranny or their blasphemy. We've escaped that wrath. And yet it's crucial for every Christian this morning to recognize that the Father still has no problem providing the discipline of loving correction to the backside of the believer who's backsliding. In order to prove my point, I'd like you to quickly turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, because it's in Hebrews 12 where we find the apostle Paul. He's addressing the Hebrew believers who seem to have been slipping back into the bondage of their sinful nature. Now, let me just point out real quick that it's not uncommon for Christians to slip back into sinful habits. We're not making a practice of our sins, but we stumble back into it from time to time. That's not uncommon. I, I, I'm not up here to say that, well, God's going to punish you the very minute you make a mistake. I don't think that's the way that any Christian ought to live. But rather, I'm talking about the Christian who is slipping back into sinful habits, and, and they're not really concerned about it. Rather, they're flying the, the grace banner saying, well, I'm under the grace of God, and so I can do whatever I want now. Listen, the grace of God is not a license to sin. And if, if this sounds like something that you've been struggling with, you've been you know, living in sin all the while proclaiming the grace of God and so you're okay to do these things, all I can say to a Christian like that is just wait till your father gets home. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at Hebrews chapter 12, I, I want to begin reading at verse 5. Here Paul declares, You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here in these verses, we find Paul, he's helping his audience to understand that the born-again believer who has escaped the wrath of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is still a child of God who is subject to the loving correction of the Lord. And it's important to grasp this. Having received the grace of God doesn't mean that we're now free from all punishment here on earth. No. There will be times when the Lord does punish us because we are his children as Christians. The Lord Jesus even confirmed this truth in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, where he declares, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Christian, listen, it's possible that you're a born-again believer who has been backsliding and, and you've been slipping back into old habits and, and now you might even find yourself living in sin. And if so, it's possible that you're trying to justify your sinful decisions under the banner of God's grace. And if this sounds like you, I would encourage you with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent because the Lord Jesus has promised to rebuke and chasten those whom he loves. Before you receive that chastening, before you receive that love and correction, just correct yourself. Just get your life back on track with the Lord and ask him for the power to help you, and he will. But maybe you find yourself this morning and you're under the correction of the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been receiving that rebuke and that chastisement of God the Father. And if so, I would just point out, I, I know it's not joyful. I know it's painful. 
And yet we have to remember that his chastisement will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so if you're receiving the correction of the Lord this morning, remember, it's evidence of his love for you. It's proof that you are his son or his daughter. And though it doesn't feel good, it is for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness.